as we join together this morning. I'm singing whatever's true, whatever is true, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is life. Lead me in the way everlasting. Don't ever stop. Don't ever stop. Seek with all my heart and Set my eyes, set my mind upon your word And Jesus, you are the way, you are the way Let's continue uh, just to lift him up together today.
sons and your daughters, that the God of the universe, of all creation, that you call us your own, that we are loved by you, that we thank you that we can hold on to that truth today. Yes, you're good, Lord. Yes, you're so good. But you can go ahead and have a seat today. And as we prepare for communion today, um, and if you didn't get the chance to grab one of those cups out there on the table on your way in, you can feel free to get up. On each corner of the room, you'll see tables there with the communion elements on them, and you can feel free to get up and take some of those. Um, but as we take communion together today, you know, we're just reminded of what Jesus says to his disciples when he was taking communion with them on the last supper and he took the bread and said take this because this is my body which is broken for you 
And in the same way, it says he took the cup and as he passed it around, he said, do this in remembrance of me, that this represents my blood which will be poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. You see, 2,000 years ago, history changed forever when Jesus chose to take our sin, to take our shame upon his own shoulders and die in our place. So today that we may have life and new life. And that's what, that's what Jesus did for us. And that's why we take this piece of bread and this cup of juice, just to simply remember the cross. So let's pray today. God, thank you for giving us your son. And Jesus, thank you for going to the cross for us. Because where there was no way, Jesus, you made a way. And today we stand here knowing that we are called sons and daughters of the God Most High, that we are loved by you, and we thank you for that. So today we remember you each and every day of our lives, and we thank you for the cross, and thank you for the, what you're continuing to do each and every day in our lives. Because the story wasn't over when you died on the cross, but you rose again. And God, that's what you call us to do. You give us new life that we can rise again with you. We thank you, we love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, today you can feel free to take those elements whenever you're ready as we continue to lift up the name of Jesus together.
God, we thank you again for your faithfulness. We thank you that your love ran red for us, that we can have new life. And it's in Jesus' name we all prayed together and everybody said, amen. You can have a seat. Morning, church. Is anybody ready to hear from the word of the Lord? Amen, amen. We welcome you, all of you online, all of you in the house. And, uh, and hey, I want to thank everybody who last Sunday after services helped pull the carpet out. We got new flooring and it looks awesome for all of you online. We just show you that right there. I just thank everybody for that. Hey, we have some announcements about what's coming up the remainder of the month and February. So we'll have this slide put up here. This Tuesday, we have a live event from Dave Ramsey. <clears throat> That's only online. You can access that through our website. Also Wednesday in the house, starting at seven o'clock, 7 p.m. here in the house, uh, we're going to have a three-week course on, on the apologetics of the Bible, how to answer somebody if they ask you a question. So that starts here. Then Saturday we have at 9 a.m. our women's virtual Bible study. And then at 5 p.m. in the house we have Heal Our Land, a prayer gathering that is still continuing this week. And uh, January 31st, we have our open house. If you don't know what our open house is, it's for those that we've never really met, never said hi to, spend about 10 minutes together just to say, hey, here's our name. Uh, love you guys. Be part of the church. Get connected. So I uh, look forward to meeting you uh, after each service on the 31st, February. What we have coming up in February is a 10-week course, uh, a marriage course. It's Wednesday nights here in the house uh, so if you are like are not married and are thinking about getting married someday, if you are married and you have a great marriage, if you're married and your marriage is not so great, uh, that it's for everybody. It's, and it's an awesome course. I've been through it before and I look forward to that. Uh, right now in our time, in our worship time, it's our time to worship God through giving. And we have a video we prepared about tithing for that. Check this out. So, what's the deal with this whole tithing thing? Am I simply adding to the youth pastor's skinny jean collection? If God gives to me, why would I give it back? Well, first, God doesn't want our money. He wants us. When we give with a joyful heart, it shows God that we recognize that everything we have is His. We're simply borrowing on a condition that we put it to good use. Not a bad deal. Second, it requires that we remain dependent on God's grace to supply our every need. Even the birds don't worry about what they're going to eat, and how much more does God care for us than a bird? Third, we get to support God's work throughout the world. This church you're sitting in right now uses your tithes to support missionaries, feed the poor, and reach out to the community for Christ. It's a tiny price for such a huge impact. So you might be thinking, why can't I just let the rich be generous? My tithe isn't worth much at all. Well, actually, if everyone in this room, everyone sitting in American churches right now, honestly gave only 10% of their income back to God, we could add $85.5 billion to ministry around the world per year. That's enough to feed every child in Africa for life. Plus, God promises that he'll provide you with what you need and warns that we cannot serve two masters. We have to choose. Tithing is not about a dollar amount or spiritual trophies. It's about an attitude of humility, obedience, and generosity. God doesn't want our 10%. He wants us 100%. So go ahead. Pick your master. So as we prepare our hearts to give, you know, it's a time of new beginnings, right? Everybody wants to do better. Everybody wants to walk closer with Jesus. And part of that is daily Bible study, daily Bible reading. It's through prayer. It's through the fellowship and worship. But it also includes this act of giving. And in Scripture, God does challenge us 
that giving is a part of our Christian walk. If you'd like to, you can check out online. We have a, another video about tithing, and we there's actually a tithing challenge that you can sign up for if you've never giving, given steadily and regularly, consistently. Uh, I challenge you to do that and see if God would not open the floodgates. So as we prepare our hearts to give, I just want a word of prayer to that end. Father, I pray that as we strive to be a better version of who you would want us to be, I pray that in this act of giving that you would impress it upon our hearts and our minds that this is part of our walk, Lord. And I pray that we would learn about that, that we'd be challenged about that, and, and that we would be able to give. So as we give today, I know it is such a sacrifice to give financially in the world in which we live, but you've called us to do this from the very beginning. And I pray, Lord, that we would be able to do this as we faithfully follow you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Hey, we begin our, our, our second part in this a New Year message series entitled Redeeming the Time. And we get this idea from Ephesians chapter 5, which says this, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Now that phrase, redeeming the time, is translated in other versions, make the best use of our time, make every minute count, because God created you on purpose, with a purpose, and for a purpose, and he wants for us to redeem the time so we can become the best version of who he created us to be over time. So we began last week with talking about the ways that you let in become the ways that you're set in. And we're looking at that, and we're looking at this as not just a New Year's resolution, that's something that we're gonna do over 12 months, but we're looking in the long term, over 60 months, what will we look like in 2026? Uh, and you know, we want to look a little better, not just with the aging process, but with how God's created us to be. So I want to jump right into text today, and we're uh, going to read through this, this lengthy text of Elisha. Elisha is not to be confused with Elijah. So can anybody say Elisha this morning? Elisha, Elisha, right? And just to note, Elisha performed more miracles in the Bible than anybody else except for Jesus Christ himself. But Elisha wasn't in the spot where he was serving God. And we're going to read this story this morning where Elijah comes and challenges Elisha and Elijah begins to follow him. So we're going to read this story. It has three movements. And this is the first movement. We're reading from 1 Kings chapter 19, beginning with verse 19. And the Bible reads this. So Elijah went from there and he found Elisha. And you're probably wondering who Elisha's father is. It says he's the son of Shaphat. Can anybody say Shaphat? That's an unusual name, but it was his dad. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen. You run that illustration. And he himself was driving the 12th pair. Now, I didn't hear anybody else gasp, but you should have because a pair of oxen in this day would be the equivalent of this huge, green, brand new John Deere tractor. It was huge, and he had 12 pairs of these. Oh, yes, he had 12 pairs. It just to have an ox in that day would have been something. So that means that Shafat Farms was the place to be. But he's about to leave all this, even though he was gonna get this inherited to him, and that's a big deal. It goes on. Elijah went up to him and he, he threw his cloak around him. What happened? What's happening? He, he threw his cloak. This was a symbolic act, kind of like akin to Jesus calling his disciples. And Elijah is essentially saying to Elisha, come follow me. You will be my disciple. I will be your mentor. You're going to be my student. And then he says, Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. So what's he doing? He's probably taking his coat back to him, right? But no, what is, he's, he's deciding to walk away from Shaphat Farms. So he's essentially kissing the life he knew previously and what his life would be to follow God, to take a step in the direction to follow God's path for his life. And he says this, let me kiss my father and mother goodbye. He said, and, and then I will come with you. And Elijah said, go back. What have I done to you? In other words, hey, I want you, uh, I want, I want you to make sure to think twice about what I'm asking you. If you're willing to pick up your cross and follow me daily in the, in, the, in the words of the New Testament, are you really willing to do this? Because I think some people, when it comes to following Jesus, they don't think twice. And, and they're like, you know what? 
what am I going to get out of God? I mean, it's like he's a genie in a bottle. And then when the prayer isn't answered, when the relationship is lost, when you don't get the job, they're like, what did God do for me? And they flee. So he, he counts the cost. He's thinking about this language of the New Testament. I'm going to just pick up my cross and follow me. So that's the first movement that Elisha is called by God, and he makes that decision to take a step in the right direction. Now, here's the second movement. Verse 21, so Elisha left him and went back. He, he took his yoke of oxen and look, he slaughtered them. He, he burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and, and gave it to the people and they ate. This is drastic. So, so he, he's killing the cows and burning the plows. What once represented his life, he's making it final. It's over. I'm going to follow God. Then it says that it, then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. And so here he is following Elijah. He becomes his servant and get this, 18 years pass, 18 years. That's long enough to be born and graduate high school. 18 years pass, and we only find out one thing about Elisha's life, what he had been doing during this entire time. One thing, are you ready, ready to hear it? Look at this verse. He used to pour water on the hands of Elijah for 18 years. That's all we learn about this guy, being a disciple. He's pouring water on the hands of Elijah. In other words, he's a guy that stands out front dispensing the sanitizer. That was like his job. That was his thing. That's what he did. There was no sermon recorded that, he give, that he'd given. There was no miracle. But he's serving Elijah. He's pouring water. He's steady with it. He's doing it. That, that's the second movement of the story. He's being faithful and serving and learning. Now, the third movement starts with God telling Elijah, hey, you're going to die. And so Elijah tells Elijah, I'm going to die. So God evidently places it upon Elijah's heart. They're, they're traveling to the place where Elijah's going to die. And, and they get to the Jordan River, and this is where the cloak comes off again, the one that he had placed on Elijah. He takes the cloak off when they get to the edge of the Jordan River, and he takes that thing, and you've got to envision this, and he swings it down and smacks the Jordan. You never guess what happens. It parts, and they, they walk through. On dry land, he puts the cloak back on, right? And it tells us this in 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 9. One day, and so it was when they had crossed over, that Elijah saw, said to Elisha, Ask, ask, what may I do for you before I am taken from you? Hey, you've been a, a great servant for 18 years. Is, is there any one thing I can do for you before I die? And Elisha said this, Please, let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. What a bold request, right? Something this guy's been thinking about for 18 years, right? Give me a double portion of what God gave you. Now, I hope that is in your spirit, that you have seen the things of God, what God has done in other people's lives, what he's done throughout world events, world history, and what he's done maybe in your life, and you're going, God, let it be that in the future that you give me a double portion of your blessing, that I pray that you're praying that over your children. Give them a double portion. That you're praying that over your grandchildren. Give them a double portion. God, you've got, done great things in the past in our church. Lord, bless our church. May it be doubly as effective in the future. And that should be our prayer. God wants us to pray those kinds of prayers. And guess what? The Bible says when we pray bold prayers like this that God wants to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine. So he doesn't want us to pray small prayers because guess what? God might answer that small prayer and not allow for the life that he has planned for you because you're not thinking big enough. So Elijah, the, the mightiest of all the miracle workers at this point, Elijah performed 14 miracles. And he's considering the request of his understudy, right? And we read that Elijah said to Elijah, you have asked a hard thing because 14 times two is 28. That's, ooh, that's a hard thing. Nevertheless, he says, if you see me when I, when I die, when I'm taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. And you know, from that moment, Elisha never took his eyes, never blinked off of Elijah because he wanted that to happen, right? Then it happened, we read. <laughs> As they continued on, and talked that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. 
isn't that crazy? I mean, that's crazy. There's two people that recorded in scripture that didn't die. One is Elijah. You know, anybody know the other? Starts with an E. Yes, Elijah and Enoch. Don't forget that. Elijah, Enoch, Elijah, Enoch, Elijah, Enoch. And then it says this, and Elijah saw it because he never blinked, right? Elijah saw it and he cried out, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. And it says he saw him no more and he took hold of his own clothes and tore them into two pieces out of grief, out of respect, out of honor, perhaps. It says, look at this. He also took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. So envision this, this chariot, this whirlwind, Elijah, horses, and this whirlwind, he just is gone. Air horse one flies up into the sky and behold what my eyes shall see. This cloak falls off Elijah's shoulder. So what did he put on him? I can envision Elijah. It might have been hot. And he touches it and he grabs it and he goes back to the Jordan and he goes, is God going to answer my prayer? And he grabs it just like Elijah had and he cracks it on the Jordan. You never guess what happened. You never guess. <laughs> he, he cracks, and look what it says. Then he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water and said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he'd also struck the water, it was divided this way and that. And Elisha, God's new prophet, crossed over. He'd arrived. He arrived. This was his day. Now, the message that, that I'm naming the title of today's message is in the absence of a crisis. What is a crisis? A crisis illustrates to us that we can change, that change is possible when, 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 a, when a crisis is heaped upon it. Oh, I could never change. I could never do that. Well, when you have a crisis in your life, you actually can change because if you had to, what can a mother do? A mother can pick up a car if she has to, right? Because her baby's in the car. If you had to, what could you do if you had to? If you had to, you could change a tire. If you've never changed a tire in your life and you're up in the mountains and you have a flat tire, you can't call AAA because you have no cell service, you could change a tire. My wife isn't here today. So I wanna tell on you, hey, honey, if you're watching, it's a good illustration, I think, to make this point. She calls me one day. Honey, I have a flat tire. I said, well, honey, where are you? I'll come change it. Oh, you don't have to do that. I drove it on to the tire store a half mile away. Don't do that because it shreds the tire. If you have to, you can actually change a tire if you've never done that. You can actually do something that you've never done before. You actually are capable of change. But how do we change in the absence of a crisis, something that's not heaped upon us? How can we generate that momentum to move beyond the status quo? Look at what Tony Robbins says. Change happens when the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of change change is painful. We hate to change. We hate it. We don't like it because fasting is hard. Saving is hard. Having a healthy marriage is hard. Picking up a car is hard. Change is difficult, but we can do it in a crisis. But why can't we do it in the absence of a crisis? When the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of change. That's how we can do it. We can do this thing. So in our text, we, look at, we looked at three different movements. I wanna look at three things, and we're thinking about how can God in 60 months, how can we live the life, have, have, be the best version that you could possibly be for living for God in 60 months? How can we do this? How can we move beyond the status quo? Number one, we're gonna learn from Elisha that it's gonna take drastic action. It's gonna take drastic action to get to where we wanna be 
if we wanna be somewhere different than we are right now. And Elisha demonstrates drastic action when he kills his cows and burns the plows. He's burning up his, his John Deere tractor of all things. Kind of akin to Cortez in 1519 when he stood on the bank and he ordered that all the ships would be burnt. There's no turning back. There's no retreat. I'm going for this thing. Why is it that drastic action is so necessary in the beginning? Why is it so difficult to take that next step in the right direction? We talk about next steps so much around here, but it takes a lot to take that first step. It, it takes a spark to light the fire. You can pile up kindling all day long, but if the spark of change doesn't enter our decision-making process, we're gonna remain the same over the next five years, just an older version of the current you. It takes a spark to, to make the fire. Drastic action is needed and necessary. Why? We've got to overcome inertia in our own life. What is inertia? Well, this guy, Isaac Newton, right? Isaac Newton in around 1700, he's, he's famous for discovering like the laws of physics and all this stuff and gravity and everything. He came up with what is called the first law of motion or the first law, the, the law of inertia. What is inertia? Well, I'm gonna read what he wrote here. He says, every object will what, remain at rest or in uniform motion in a straight line unless compelled to change its state by the action of an external force. In other words, everything in the universe wants to stay the same. It wants to stay the same. It doesn't want to change. Things don't want to change. And doesn't that make so much sense? I mean, think about this word inertia. It comes from the Latin idle or lazy. I mean, think, and we're thinking about in terms of 60 months from now, right? When we apply that to the best version of you, what we're gonna look like, it's important to understand that our, our default setting is to do nothing. We don't wanna change because change is so difficult, right? Everything's lazy. Everything's idle, right? I mean, we gotta get this. Understand that this brick is lazy. That brick, if there, if there were drastic action taken to this brick, where would it be 100 years from now? It'd be sitting right where it is right now. But with drastic action, with this hammer, I can move this brick, right? But it's heavy. It's dense, has a lot of mass, so you can't move it a whole lot, but let's take this in, contra in contrast. You do that on stage. I played the clarinet growing up, just saying. But take this balloon. It doesn't have a lot of mass. You, you can even set it down and just like the air or static electricity It'll just move that balloon. And, and when, when, you, when, you dry, when, you, when you drive it with drastic action, what can you do? That balloon, it moves a lot, right? Why? Because all the force going into it allows it to move because it doesn't have that much mass. That's why I can take this brick and put it on my hand. And if I can hit it just right, glad that didn't land on my toe. I can break the brick because it's dense and all the force going into breaking the brick, it doesn't go through my hand because it didn't want to move in the first place. So all that force because of physics is dispelled through the kinetic energy through the brick. Does this make sense? Well, let me, I think that maybe I need to use a different illustration here. So what I have here is an eight pound sledge hammer. And I have a bigger brick. The bigger the hammer, the bigger the block, the bigger the stakes. I'm just saying. But this represents your life because we're talking about the ways you let in or the ways you're set in or the ways that you're stuck in right? This represents your life. So over the years, as we're going over and over and over again, it takes a lot to change. It takes a lot of energy, some drastic action before you can take that step in the right direction. So I've asked Pastor Phil, 
if he would break this block on my chest. Phil, do you want to do this today? I would love to. <laughs> wait, 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 I'm missing the whole word. That's what happens when you're, when you're old like this. But I want to talk about something else as well. And I want to talk about pressure, pressure. Pressure is also, you can learn a lot from physics. When you put force and you spread it over an area, uh, pressure can hold a lot. So we have here a bed of nails. We just conveniently had made for today. And the interesting thing about pressure is that I can lie down on this bed of nails and not be injured. But, but you think about this. You think if I were, what would happen if I were to lie down on this? It would not be a good idea because I've studied physics and what could happen because there's, there's pressure in the amount of nails that are represented here. So what we're going to do is I'm going to lie down on this bed of nails. Ooh, 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 just kidding. <laughs> and Pastor Phil, I drank too much coffee, Phil. I'm not sure about this one. So he's going to place this block on my body. And, and what we're illustrating here is it takes a lot of force to break this brick, this block. But what I want you to understand is this block doesn't want to move. It wants to stay the same. And the energy coming down on that block, this block doesn't want to go through my body. You don't want to go through my body, do you, block? So when he busts this, the energy spent with wailing this eight-pound sledgehammer is used just to overcome the inertia and the breaking of the block. There is some kinetic energy that causes that. So safety first, whenever you have somebody using a sledgehammer on you. <laughs> Phil, are you sure you're ready to do this? I think so. Okay, bro, safety first. Okay, make it good. All right, you ready? I'm ready. Here you go. Oh, I'm glad I had that protective device. Oh. And I'm okay, right? I'm okay, yes. Oh, Phil, thank you. Oh, so, I almost stuck my hands on the nails. So, I give him another hand, will you? And those, um, I had Graham build the bed of nails. Anthony brought the bricks in. I just appreciate you guys making that possible. But this, essentially, is your life. This is the story of your life. What you set into motion, you take this drastic action. It's so difficult to change because all the effort that you take in just getting through life, you just end up doing the status quo and it takes all the energy just to, to, to break the block, but it takes so much energy just to make it to where you are. So it takes a much greater progression to make new things happen in your life. Why? Because of inertia, because we're all lazy. We don't want to change. And let's just illustrate that a little bit. That's why baptism is so important. What a drastic action to go down into the water and be raised up out of the water saying, Jesus, I'm all wet for you. It's a drastic act, is it not, to say, I declare you're the Lord of my life. And I remember my baptism. It's vivid. Why? Because I came up out of the water head to toe wet, but I was so thankful I was forgiven and free. But that's drastic action. That's a drastic step to follow Jesus. That's why fasting is such a drastic action. Why would I starve myself? Why would I uh, not do these things that I love? Why would I, I not watch television? Because I want to hear from heaven. It's a drastic act calling on God to answer my prayers, something like you may have never done before. It's a drastic act to break up with somebody who's no good for you, but God's got a plan for your life and somebody for your life. And, and we should find our solace in God alone, but we ought to trust in him, but it's a drastic act. It's a drastic act to draw a line and say no more. The time for half measures is over, it's done. Otherwise, if we stay in the status quo five years from now, you're gonna be the same version of you, just a little bit older just a little more exaggerated, if you remember last week. So that's the first step. If change is ever going to happen in your life, there has to be, number one, drastic action. Number two, what's it going to take to change? There's a second thing in Elisha's story. It's going to take steady progression. 
steady progression. Slow and steady. What was it for 18 years that Elisha did? Pour water, pour water, pour water. Steady progression, pouring water, being faithful. So drastic action starts the movement, but it takes daily, this progression. Steady, steady, steady. Epictetus, the Greek philosopher, said this. No great thing is created, how? Suddenly, any more than a bunch of grapes or a fig. If you tell me that you desire a fig, I answer you that there must be what? Time. Let it first blossom, then bear fruit, then ripen. You see, whatever change you want to take and make, it takes time. It takes a season of time. That's why God made seasons. There's summer and winter, a change of seasons. There's sowing and reaping. And we're thinking in terms of a year from now, it's not limited to that. We're thinking in terms of 60 months, even 60 years to become the best version that God would have us become. So to modernize it a little bit uh, from the Greek philosopher, a modern day philosopher, Darren Hardy, and in his book, The Compound Effect, put it this way. I want to read this to you. It's time someone told it to you straight. You've been bamboozled for too long. There's no magic bullet, secret formula, or quick fix. He goes on. You don't make 200 grand a year spending two hours a day on the internet, lose 30 pounds in a week, rub 20 years off your face with a cream, fix your love life with a pill, or find lasting success in any other scheme that's too good to be true. It would be, what, great if you could buy your success, fame, self-esteem, good relationships, and health and well-being in a nicely clamshelled package at the local Walmart, but that's not how it works. What's it going to take? It takes watering. It takes dreaming. It takes sowing, worship, Jesus coming into the house of God, saving, loving, right choices, right people, day in, day out, planted in the house of God. John Maxwell said it like this, improvement doesn't happen in a day, but it must be daily. It's not gonna happen in a day. You're not gonna change overnight, but it's gotta happen daily. And what is that? Steady progression, drastic action, steady progression, and there's a third movement that follows these two things, and this is enjoy momentum. Enjoy momentum. You think about Elisha, all that he had blowing into his life, all the steady progression of pouring the water, He's just filling up his life with the small decisions that he's making daily. Momentum, momentum is where you want to be. Momentum is where you want to be. Um, by the way, when you have one nail, um, we learned about pressure. One nail, it, uh, one thing in life, one drastic action in life is really not enough because what can happen if you have one nail? But if you have nail after nail after nail after nail, what can happen in your life when you have nail after nail after nail? You have pressure. This is why God designed a church. You have people around you who care about you. When you have people around you, they can lift you up. They can encourage you, pray for you. Not just one person, but an entire church. That's the way God designed the church. That we can take the pressures of this life and be saved by his church. Now, here's why inertia, there's two sides of the coin. Because he said this, what? Newton said, things at rest stay at rest. Things in motion stay in motion in a straight line. I mean, think about the space shuttle. Think about that. It's, it's hooked up 
to its base. It takes more fuel to get it off of it. It's, it's an object that's at rest and it takes so much to get that thing to become an object in motion, right? And, and, and so the fuel is used and there's liftoff and there's power and it's shot up and uses its fuel and it's into space and what's it doing in space? It go, there's no friction and it goes on and on and on in a straight line in the vacuum of space because objects in motion will remain in motion. So I wanna to try to illustrate this. So what was Elisha's job? What was his job for 18 years? Yeah. Sharp brick. So he poured water. So what we're gonna do, I'm kinda thirsty. Steady, 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 steady. So what I'm gonna do is uh, I wanna put this tray, interesting illustration. I'm gonna put this tray on top of these water glasses representing Elijah, Elisha, he was faithful. Toilet paper rolls. It's always great to get a second use out of them, right? So I'm gonna set these on here. You know, typically when we see the toilet paper roll, we're surprised when we see them. Sometimes we're actually terrified when we see them. So I wanna set these oranges on top of these toilet paper rolls, these toilet paper rolls they're supporting these objects. They're not in motion. They're at rest. They don't want to move. But when we apply pressure, not that way, but when we apply pressure, we're going to knock out the support systems. And if, if Newton was right, we're going to learn that objects in motion stay in motion in a straight line. He's right. This is a story of your life. Amen, right? Oh, this is a story of your life, truthfully. It's, it's possible for you, when you take drastic action and, and you go forth and you're steady over time, you reach the place in 60 months from now where your life is in a place where you're living the best version that God created you to be. And that is when you can enjoy the momentum of God blessing your life. That's why I'm challenging everybody to fast. Fasting is drastic action. Nothing is gonna change your life and bring you closer to God than fasting, but it's drastic. And I encourage you for, for the next eight days, we're gonna start this January 18th. For the next 18th, read what's on our website. We have two incredible articles on why we fast and how we can fast. And I encourage you to read those and be inspired and do this thing you may have never done before to be the best version that God would have you to be. Now, your fast can be anything that you want it to be. You can fast from food. You can fast from tobacco. You can fast from news or television, but do this thing, read this thing and allow God, just think about it. What if, if you look back on your life five years ago and you look at your life today, maybe you're thinking, you know what? I'm kind of disappointed where I'm at. Well, if there's no drastic action taken, I'm telling you the truth of God gives you life. And 60 months from now, you're gonna be the same version of you just a little bit older. Why not? Why not? Join us in this fast to take this drastic action. In a year from now, two years, three years, five years, 18 years, you'll be found faithful and God will be delivering the life where you can enjoy the momentum of a faithful walk with Jesus Christ. What do you want to look like in five years? Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your truth and 
just through how you've created all things, even physics, that we can learn the law of motion and understand that we really don't want to change. And the truth is, it's difficult to change. The longer we go, the more difficult it is because we're dense. There's a lot of mass in our lives. And just to be able to get beyond that, it's so much force just to move beyond the status quo. Father, help us to think in long term. Help us to know that we have the power, those of us who are Christ followers, the power of your Holy Spirit living in us to be able to take that next step, no matter the cost. There's no turning back. Burn the John Deere tractor. Lord, call us to something that's a better version that you've created us to be. And Father, I pray that if anyone is hearing my voice right now and they've never place their faith in Jesus. I pray that they would heed scripture about this thing called baptism, this drastic action where we get wet. But you say when we actually come up out of that water, you call us a new creation in Christ. Who's Jesus? Lord God, if someone has never heard the gospel, that you sent your one and only son, not to condemn us, but to save us from our sins, that he died on a cross and you resurrected him from the grave to be the ultimate sacrifice for sin, my sin. And when somebody places their faith in Jesus that you promise, you will forgive their sin and remember it no more, that you would promise them a new life, a new life, eternal life. Father, I pray today that we would all take our next step in you, no matter the cost. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's go and stand together as we close out today, uh, just continuing to sing of God's love for us and how great and awesome He is.
God who is on your side. He is fighting for you, and I hope you know that today. Um, if you need prayer for any reason, we have prayer tables up here near the stage that if you uh, would like some prayer or just to pray with somebody, they're there for you. Otherwise, we'll see you back here next week, and have a great uh, rest of your week, everybody.